Welcome to Bay Focus today. We have a special program plan. We took our cameras recently to a conference held here in Central Florida called Bless Israel USA. This is an amazing organization that partners with Israel, the nation of Israel, in really providing assistance to humanitarian organizations, bringing Christians and Jews together, Messianic Jews and those that have accepted Christ, all kinds of different people that just love Israel. And they have created an annual event uh, to celebrate Israel and to raise funds to help charitable organizations. So we took our cameras there and we got to talk with some of the speakers. They had an incredible lineup of speakers at Bless Israel USA. And you're going to get to meet a few of them, including the founders of Promise Keepers and, and also a well-known person coming from Israel. So let's go to Bless Israel USA and take a look. Bless Israel USA 2014 was held at Champions Church in Winter Haven, Florida. Hundreds of people attended with the shared goal of showing support for Israel and giving financially to Israeli charitable organizations. The day's events included seminars and an evening worship service, praise and worship led by Joshua Aaron, a special painting by artist Keith Goodson, and a message by the Harbinger author Jonathan Kahn. Additional speakers at the conference included Promise Keepers President and CEO, Dr. Raleigh Washington, and Promise Keepers founder and college football Hall of Fame coach, Bill McCartney. Coach McCartney shared with us how Promise Keepers became involved in supporting Israel and Jewish believers in Christ. Promise Keepers' biggest rally in Washington, D.C., we had 1.4 million men, and at that event, uh, we did a, an extraordinary job of acknowledging uh, believers across racial boundaries. And then the next year we had an event in Atlanta where more than 40,000 pastors gathered. And at the end of the event in 1997, a pastor who's Jewish said, what about us? <laughs> and we said, who are you? <laughs> and they said, said we're, we're Jewish and we, we love Yeshua. And so Raleigh uh, led the charge to discover who they were, wow. the Jewish believers. So we, as recently as 1997, mm -hmm. we needed to be educated. But since that time, we really have dove in. Oh, yes. Yes, you have it a big way. And one thing I want to say, um, Dr. Washington, too, let me ask you this. And, and for our viewers, too, you, you have an incredible background yourself because you pastored. You've been a pastor, you have been awarded you know, the Bronze Star um, for military service in Vietnam, and you've been involved in Promise Keepers all these years. Um, and then you're here too for Bless Israel USA because Promise Keepers even has an arm of the ministry called One Message. That's all part of this, right? It's very much a part of this. Uh, One Message is simply defined, hear and obey the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, resulting in sharing with the poor and standing with God's chosen people. The bottom line is, if you hear and obey the Word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, if you are daily search and uh, you are fed with the Word of God on a daily basis, uh, then you'll be led by the Spirit. And being led by the Spirit says you have to embrace God's chosen people. Our Savior of the world, Jesus, happens to be Jewish. God chose that. And as non-Jewish believers, we must answer and respond to his prayer. He prayed that everyone, these are his apostles, those are everybody who believe in Jesus through his word. And that's everyone, these are Jewish apostles, those are Gentiles, that they would be one, just as he and the Father are one, that the world would believe that he indeed is the Messiah, the sent one. So his high priestly prayer, the center focus of it is that Jewish believers, Gentile believers, and that's everybody would stand together as one. And if they did come together as one, the world would know that Jesus is Messiah. So celebrate Israel, bless Israel, that's what we're doing now, is yeah. simply following the, the prayer of our Lord and being obedient to the Word of God. Okay, this is, let's take this turn. And, um, Coach McCartney, because you, you are also have some, just along the lines also, but Dr. Washington said some scriptural basis. Translate this into day-to-day -day for a believer, because there's some things that, that daily that we can do, and, and you've devoted a lot of your life. You, you, I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit of progression, because there was a time that God told you to step away mm -hmm. from Promise Keepers. To relate that a little bit, and then he kind of took you a new direction. Well, Promise Keepers uh, exploded. 
it was the rage. Every time we would announce we were going somewhere, men don't usually do this, mm -hmm. sign up early. Yeah. But, but we were filling stadiums three or four months in advance. Mm -hmm. And these events were transforming. I can't tell you how many altar calls where we just started sobbing, deep sobs, because we've never seen so many guys come and want to be born of the Spirit, I want to be cleansed of sin. So God used promise keepers in a mighty way, rallying men. A real man, a man's man, he's a godly man. He's a man who's falling deeper and deeper in love with Almighty God. And so his, you know, what happens to us as men when we take on the, the gospel and we start to ingest it into our lives mm -hmm. is we, the, the Lord transforms us and mm -hmm. renews us mm -hmm. and we become guys that God can use. Yeah. And that's what we've seen happen on a, on a grand scale uh, over the last many years. And then when the stadium stopped filling and they, we were having trouble filling large churches at some yeah. point. So the question begged, Lord, are you done? Is this it? Because we were very honored and humbled to be a part of what God had done. But he never shut it down. And Dr. Raleigh Washington took over the lead. And um, he, you know, he's a preacher deluxe. The word of God is, is in his heart. He, he loves the word and divides the word supernaturally. And so when I saw what was in his heart, uh, I knew that there's more to come, but I didn't know when. And now what we're leading up to right now is what's Okay, to come. so that's a great transition. So you, you paved the way, the road, and, and you're hearing God's voice, and, and God is a huge ministry. And, and for those of our viewers, um, Dr. Washington, that may be new in the faith or may, may not have known about Promise Keepers, if you will just give them the, the short explanation of what it is and what, what is this new step you're taking now? Well, as Coach said, Promise Keepers is a ministry to men. Uh, uh, transforming men uh, worldwide has been the focus of Promise Keepers. Now, the Promise Keepers uh, focus is to uh, transform men so that they may transform their world. And so Promise Keepers is still doing men's ministry. But out of Promise Keepers, we've launched a ministry called One Message. And that one message, hear and obey the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, resulting and sharing with the poor and standing with God's chosen people. All of that follows the foundation of what Coach has said. If we want to obey the Word of God and respond to the high priestly prayer of our Lord, we need to be about the business of understanding our calling and responsibility to stand arm in arm with the Jewish believer. That's what will hasten the return of our Lord. That's what he prayed for. In Ephesians 2 says that's why he died. It says in Ephesians 2, he is our peace, Jesus, who broke down the barrier of the dividing wall of hostility, that's at the cross, mm -hmm. between the two groups. The Bible only talks about two groups, Jew and Gentile, creating one new man, thus establishing peace. One new man is Jewish and Gentile believer standing together as one. That's, that's his prayer. That's what he prayed for. That's what he went to the cross and died for. And that's what Celebrate Israel is all about. And Promise Keepers has a ministry. One message, delivering that same message nationally and internationally. And that is, that is pr in practical terms, that's still some meetings, right? You're going and holding Ab different absolutely. rallies doing absolutely. that. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so that's, you have some coming up. We have one message uh, 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 event coming up uh, in Abilene on the 20th and 21st of next month. Last mm -hmm. month we were uh, uh, in Louisiana. Yeah. These are one message meetings, but also at the Promise Keepers meeting uh, uh, here in Florida yeah. uh, on the, on the uh, 16th and the 17th of May in mm -hmm. Florida at the Titus Harvest Dome in Jacksonville, Florida, will be a Promise Keepers men's event. And that men's event, we close with a message that will focus on Jesus' reign. So we're giving this message not only to the men, but to everyone. Oh, good. That, this, is, this is powerful. This is a, this is a complete, um, you see a ministry evolving. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great to see that because God does different things you know he can take a ministry and one one final question and, and this is probably too deep because we don't have a lot of time left 
but this might be too deep to get into, but I'm going to throw it to you, Dr. Washington, see if you can do this as, as succinctly as possible. I think because what you guys are trying to do is, and you're trying to bring evangelical believers as well, and believers as a whole, all believers in together to have a greater understanding with the Messianic Jewish community and Jewish believers. Um, and sometimes they don't always understand each other and how they're, you know, because they may worship differently, may do different things differently. How can you bring those groups together? Uh, I think you bring them together. It sounds simplistic, but yet it's profound. All you need to do is hear and obey the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit because it's in the Word to the Jewish believer and to the Gentile believer that we need to stand together as one. I don't need to be Jewish. I can't be Jewish. Yeah. You know, I was black yesterday. I'm black today. I bet you I'll be black tomorrow. The Jewish person is Jewish. Yeah. But as believers, we both believe in the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. And so we worship him. The Messianics worship him in a Jewish fashion in many ways because they want to see, show the Jewish people that Christianity foundation and roots are Jewish. Mm -hmm. And so we need to stand with them and support that and believe in that. And so many Gentiles will worship with uh, uh, the, uh, the Jewish people in the Jewish fashion. But the dynamic is we stand together as one. We embrace one another. We support one another because we believe in the Jewish Messiah and we believe in the salvation of Israel because that's what will cause the return of our Lord. That is the best and quick and most of thing I have ever, <laughs> ever heard it. I have to tell you, that was a complicated question and you nailed it. Thank, Thank you. you both Thank so you. much for Thank being you. on the program today. God bless you. Thank bless you. you. Kalev Myers, founder of the Jerusalem Institute of Justice, a human rights organization in Israel, also spoke at the Bless Israel USA conference. Kalev immigrated to Israel from the U.S. and is a graduate of Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He is also a practicing lawyer in Israel and a television commentator. Kalev shares why he became a human rights activist in Israel. I started the Institute, Darlene, in 2004 because uh, I was working, I was already working as a lawyer, but more focusing in commercial law at that time. Uh, but I became aware of uh, civil rights problems within the Israeli society uh, that I felt uh, um, uh, the need to engage in and, and get involved in, uh, in order to particularly advocate on behalf of uh, freedom of religion and, and equal application of law to all re religious streams within uh, the Israeli society. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, but it's not a complete utopia of civil and human rights. We have our yeah. issues, like every Western democracy. Yeah. And so I started uh, representing people on a pro bono basis, um, and I was able to do that by uh, raising donations to the Jerusalem Institute of Justice. And that organization would then pay the law firm where I was working for, for as an associate so I could represent people for free. That's basically the way we got started. Oh my goodness, and, and, you, and you chose Israel because of its fact that it is a democracy and, and, and its location there to really start it there, and you'd gone there that was a good location okay. to do it. You wouldn't say Israel, start it here in the U.S. Israel, Israel is yeah. the only place in the Middle East where someone who wants to advance civil rights, a lawyer who wants to advance civil rights, actually has the ability to do so. Wow. And so it's the only nation in the Middle East that has proper uh, freedom of, of expression, rule of law, an independent court system, the separation of powers. Uh, and, uh, and freedom of religion, these other uh, equality and these other basic constitutional rights that we would call them in the United States don't exist in any other nation. Yeah. And so if you, were even to, if you were to be an advocate that would even speak out and criticize the government and any of the Muslim dictatorships or, that are neighbors of Israel, you're likely to be arrested, if not tortured, if not executed. And so it's, uh, you know, uh, the Israeli society has the ability to do that. And, and the fact is that uh, out of the 550 cases, more than 550 cases that we've handled in the Jerusalem Institute of Justice over the last 10 years, um, we've, we've only lost two cases. Uh, that's amazing. That I, yeah, and, so, and that, that's including 22 uh, successful appearances before the Israeli Supreme Court. And we have a very uh, functioning, healthy democracy. Yeah, um, that's, yeah. That's, that's very true. And you're definitely a, a light in that part of the world. And I, there's so many things I'd love to ask you because of, I know we have some time constraints, but of, of your take on, on some of the things going on in the Middle East. But let me make sure that we cover first because the ground that what you're doing there. Because one of the things about this Bless Israel USA organization yeah. is they want to do things to help Israel, to partner, to, to do some things. So let's find out, because these are some of the areas that you're working in there. Um, human rights is the overall term with the Institute of Justice, but that translates into some distinct areas. Yeah. Is in, And there's one of them I'm thinking uh, is human trafficking, but it has a little bit different face in Israel, doesn't it? That's right. Israel was a, was a major um, destination of human trafficking. If you go back 
a decade ago. And in 2006, we, we found ourselves in a, very, in a terrible place on the, on the uh, TIP uh, report, which is a report that's done by the State Department of Trafficking in Persons. It, it's, by the way, it's a little bit of, of a uh, hypocritical um, report because the, the one nation that's never critiqued is the United States, where you have you know, 150,000 people being trafficked in, yeah. a major traffic per year, a major trafficking and it's growing. problem. But, yeah. but Israel was put in a bad place, which then uh, actually jeopardized uh, our ability to receive uh, funding and support from the United States government. So the Israeli government started getting engaged in, in an effort to crack down on human trafficking. Human trafficking was illegal, uh, even at that time. But um, but it was it wasn't being properly executed by by uh, or fought by our uh, by our government. Um, they weren't enforcing the laws so well. Um, so in two, if you the numbers back then would have been you know up to around five thousand women a year were being trafficked into Israel. The the normal story was most of them were coming from the former Soviet Union countries like Moldova, Uzbekistan, Ukraine, etc. That have false human resources companies there that would advertise work in the Middle East. The women would sign up for the program. When they were en route to the Middle East, they would be abducted, uh, stripped of their identity papers of their dignity, and then smuggled with the help of Bedouin tribes across the Sinai-Israeli border into Israel and put to forced uh, sex slavery. This, this was happening to thousands of women. The Israeli government got engaged and started uh, enforcing the anti-trafficking laws. Uh, the, also, the smartest thing our government did was eventually build a fence on the Sinai-Israeli border, which uh, stopped a lot of it. Those numbers have now decreased to maybe a couple hundred women, maybe, per year are, are being trafficked in. Um, during those years, the Jerusalem Institute of Justice was fighting human trafficking in two ways. Number one, we participated in a uh, coalition of organizations that helped break up the, the biggest trafficking ring in the Middle East. It was a Cyprus, Russia, Israeli group. We did a lot of translation of documents from Hebrew, of testimonies from Hebrew into Russian when this trafficking group was actually tried in Russia and, uh, and, and, and convicted. Uh, and penalized and helped to break up that group. And we also gave pro bono legal representation to women that had been trafficked into Israel and were trying to break out of the cycle. And so, for instance, we had a few cases of women that were purchased by a client of a brothel. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, they, they had children. And when the relationship broke up, the father would claim sole custody of the children and then report the woman to the Ministry of Interior as an illegal alien to try to get her kicked out of Israel. So we had to fight two legal battles, one in the family court to keep the custody with the mother because you don't want these type of men being responsible for children, and number two, to, before the government to keep the, the women in Israel. And we were successful in all those cases. But as the numbers of human trafficking decreased slowly, we changed our focus in our organization to fighting prostitution. So instead of you know uh, 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 swatting at mosquitoes, we're trying to dry up the swamp, dry up the demand for, for prostitution in Israel, which, which is really what's feeding human trafficking. Prostitution is not illegal in yeah, Israel. That's, yet. that's the part that I didn't know until I yeah. looked into this. Yeah. That, that's, that's a harder that's harder to fight. You're going against what people think of it if it's, it's, if it's hard, illegal. It's, yeah. hard to, it's hard to fight. Uh, not just because of public perception, because it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry with a lot of money and a strong lobby, like in many of the nations where it exists. But we helped to draft a legislative uh, um, initiative based on a Swedish legislative model which criminalizes the client. So in many countries like the United States, for instance, both the pimp, the john, and the prostitute are criminals, but the prostitute is usually the one that ends up being arrested and prosecuted because she's the most vulnerable person. Well, we see the prostitute as a victim. In other words, it's a statistical fact that over 80% of the women who end up in the prostitution were somehow sexually harassed or abused when they were young women and they lost their human dignity, etc. So we see them as a victim, so we want to criminalize the client. And it'll make it a criminal offense to purchase sex slavery in Israel. Israel gets criticized a lot um, for, for its, its points of views in, in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and, and the, the very fact that, you know, um, they, that they're occupiers, supposedly. And, but you try to show light on human rights abuses um, in the Palestinian um, uh, hierarchy as well and the leadership yeah. there. And, and then also you have a lone soldier project. I don't know if you can hit those two in, in some of your bullets quickly for us because you're actively involved in those two. Then I have one yeah. final question for yeah, you. Yeah, no problem. Israel is being obsessively condemned as the greatest yeah. abuser of human rights in yeah. the Middle East, which is completely infactual and unbased in, in reality. Um, if you compare, the, the, again, the freedoms we have in the Israeli society compared to the Palestinian Authority, which is a governing entity, an interim governing entity, which was given responsibility to certain areas, 
beyond the 1949 armistice lines and was uh, under the Oslo Accords of 1994 and is supposed to eventually become a Palestinian state, they've proven themselves to be terrible abusers of human rights. And the thing is that if you're a Palestinian living under the Palestinian Authority, you have no ability to speak up about these issues. I can't represent them in the Palestinian Authority, people who are being abused, because I'm not licensed to practice law there. But what I can do is expose these abuses to the world so that the entities that are funding the world, the international community, which is the United States and Europe, which are uh, giving a combined amount of a billion dollars a year to the Palestinian Authority, should start monitoring these funds. I, I think we should expose the human rights abuses so these entities start monitoring the funds to make sure they're being leveraged to advance the welfare of the Palestinian people and advance human rights because it's not happening on the ground today. For instance, over the last year and a half, three men received prison sentences in Palestinian courts and the Palestinian Authority simply for posting a joke or criticism regarding President Mahmoud Abbas on their Facebook page. And to think that you can somehow, and they're put in prison. And so to think that you, are, you can somehow speak up and have some kind of freedom of expression to critique the government, etc. And so there's honor killings of women, and there's yeah. abuse of Christian rights by the Muslim uh, majority, and there's a su suppression of freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, etc. So this same entity that's receiving these huge amounts of money from Western governments that are supposed to believe in upholding you know, a separation of powers and human rights and, fr and personal freedoms and democracy is completely abusing all these rights. And nobody's really talking about it. Yeah, so that's what you guys are doing. You're shining the yeah, light on it. We're trying to shine the light on it to bring a more balanced it, view of what's happening. You can but you can shine the light on it and hope that those that are funding it will take a look. Exactly. Okay. Um, and then I'm just, I'm just going to briefly uh, mention, you do something, you help soldiers of your um, armies and, and your military that don't have families, you guys step yes. in and, and provide for them. That's yeah. so cool. I love yeah. that. Yeah. There's a couple thousand soldiers in, in uh, Israel that don't have families. Most soldiers, uh, you know, is, Israel is a country that if you're serving the IDF, you, you have active duty. And every two or three weeks you come home, you come to your family, you have a place to shower and rest and eat and recuperate before you're sent back to the front line. The lone soldiers, or who we, these people we call lone soldiers, they don't have any family uh, framework. So they could be new immigrants that uh, have come by themselves and serve in the IDF. The, most of the lone soldiers in Jerusalem, where the Jerusalem Institute of Justice is located, the people that we're taking care of, the reason that they don't have families is become, they come from an ultra-Orthodox background. It's a little bit of a, of a complicated issue within the Israeli society, but most ultra-Orthodox men do not serve in the army. There's this blanket exemption that they don't have to go into the army. That's something that's actually changing. It was, it's just changing now with new legislation coming out in the Knesset. But these young men, when they decide to step away from the ultra-Orthodox lifestyle and become more secular, thus they want to serve in the army so that they can, the army is sort of like the melting pot of Israeli society and then afterwards they'll be able to get a job and get into the marketplace and so on and so forth. They're completely rejected by their family. Some of the families actually have a funeral for them and completely you know, disown wow. them just for deciding to serve in the IDF. Um, it, wow. It's sort of the opposite of conscientious objector. Yeah. It's conscientious um, uh, you know, engagers, your <laughs> and, okay. and so, uh, so these soldiers are suffering because of a a uh, choice of conscience. We adopt them in the Jerusalem Institute of Justice. There's about a hundred of them in Jerusalem. We feed uh, every weekend for a Friday night what we call Kabbalat Shabbat, which is you know mm -hmm. the traditional uh, Jewish meal. We feed them in a hotel that's owned by a friend of mine, and then over the holidays we we give them gifts and have events for them and mobilize the community and really become a family for people mm -hmm. without families. That I think that's it's an incredible thing that you do, and it and it's it's different from some of the other things you do in the organization. Um, all right, a final question. You're here at the Bless Israel USA event. Why do you think it's important for you to come? From, from Israel to talk to a Christian group like this, and what do you hope to accomplish with that? I, I felt it was important for me to come because there's an erosion of Christian support for the state of Israel today, which I think is very dangerous to the uh, future of our nation. Um, you know, the, the traditional Bible-believing conservative evangelical movement, which sees Israel as a fulfillment of, of biblical prophecy, is going to continue to stand with Israel. But more mainline churches are getting behind movements now to boycott Israel, divest from Israel, to sanction Israel, because they're, they're buying into um, rhetoric and propaganda from pro-Palestinian uh, sources that are painting Israel as an abuser of human rights, as an apartheid state, and, and an abuser of justice, etc. I'm coming as a civil rights, human rights 
advocate who's challenged my own government on many issues and saying, wait a second, friends, Christians who love Israel need to understand that if you want to advance justice in the Middle East, support the only democracy in the Middle East. And I'm here to encourage Christians not to uh, run away from the, from, from the uh, justice dialogue, to, but to embrace the human rights dialogue as a reason to support Israel. The Bless Israel USA organization will continue to host events in the years ahead as they work to unite business, ministry, and community leaders together to support Israel. the Bless Israel USA organization, please call 813-424-7900 or send an email to contact at blessisraelusa.org. You can also find out more about Bless Israel USA online at www.blessisraelusa.org. The Christian Television Network it is all about proclaiming the gospel. All over the world. It's about connecting you with your local community. It's about family and everything that affects the home. CTN is about keeping you fit. In spirit, soul, and body. CTN is about bringing you exciting guests. Who are making a difference in the kingdom. At CTN, we're about being here for you anytime, day or night. Well, I hope you enjoyed going behind the scenes at Bless Israel USA and the interviews we had there and then also the, the church service and what an incredible service it was. But I also want to say thank you to Champions Church in Winter Haven, Florida for welcoming, welcoming us like they did allowing us to bring the cameras behind the scenes and also the Bless Israel USA leadership that um, made such a, a great opening for us there as well to interview the incredible people, Promise Keepers, also Kalev Myers from Israel. Very, very inspirational for, for those of us that attended there. But I also want to encourage you, there's some exciting things coming up here locally for the National Day of Prayer on Thursday, May 1st. We want to gather together as Christians and pray for our nation, pray for Israel, pray for God's will to be done and, and souls to be saved into the kingdom. And you can go to Steinbrenner Field in Tampa on Thursday night, May 1st at 7 o'clock. And you can gather with, with all kinds of churches and people that are going to be um, praying and praise and worship. And, and then also at Bright House Field in Clearwater on the Pinellas County side at 7 o'clock as well. Uh, an incredible event they have every year. Again, bringing people from all over that come together to pray for our nation, pray for our communities, pray for our families. You don't want to miss these two events. And these are opportunities for you to make a difference and, and with your fellow believers to to pray for God's will to be done in our nation. I want to thank you for tuning in this week. And, and you know, the theme today, too, in the show, pray for Israel. Let's pray for Israel. God will bless us if we do. I will see you next week on Bay Focus. May God richly bless you.